Well, like John, this is a very great pleasure for me. It's also a great pleasure actually to share this with John because when I opened the letter from the Tyler Prize Committee, which before I first learned who the other person was, you know, I was at my desk and I needed to avert my eyes only a little bit and there's the great textbook of John Seinfeld the, who is this kind of the Bible in this field on air pollution. Sort of like reading Shakespeare or Charles Dickens, you know, you don't quite get it every time you read it, but you get learn, every, learn something more when you read it again. Um, and of course, a long list of uh, distinguished laureates in the past. I might note that afterwards, we, you get to um, guess or vote on which one of us you think uh, lived in Hawaii for 20 years. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk, um, you know, John, uh, it's in, we didn't coordinate, but uh, we could have, because I'm, he talked from the top down, I'm going to talk from the bottom up. But I am going to get to the top eventually, toward the end of my talk. So um, we've been uh, doing this for about a third of a million years, cooking with um, wood or other solid fuels. Indeed, you can call it the oldest human occupation, because um, uh, Levi Strauss, for example, perhaps the uh, foremost anthropologist, certainly of the 20th century, um, used the control of fire as the defining moment when we changed from pre-human to human state. And that occurred a third of a million years ago, something we've been doing a long time. Um, today, we use not only wood, but um, Here's wood, but uh, crop residue. So 10,000 years ago, presumably when we first started uh, growing things in agriculture, we probably started burning crop residues. And then maybe 1,000 years ago in certain parts of the world, coal started to be used. And they're still used by hundreds of millions, billions of people today. Uh, and they are the problem. Now I'm going to focus, uh, coal has special problems, so I'm going to be focusing mostly on the biomass part of this. This is a picture in a Chinese village. Chinese households are very complicated in terms of energy, partly because of this mixture of fuels. Today, this, uh, if we take a look at today, the use of these fuels is uh, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and a bits and pieces other places, China. Now the poor use these fuels. In fact, you could have no, no better definition of poor. Somebody sends you an email today from Mars and says, I'm going to be visiting tomorrow afternoon. I've only got two hours. How do I find poor people? Go to some place where they're cooking with open biomass fires. I can guarantee you that none of the t billion t poorest people in the world are using gas. And I can dare guarantee you that none of you is using open biomass fires in your households or indeed any of the t richest three billion people in the world. It is a characteristic of poverty, which complicates, of course, the uh, epidemiology and other, you know, how to separate the effects of the smoke from the effects of the poverty. Um, getting better or worse? Well, we all started, 100% of us, uh, you know, our ancestors using these fuels, but what's the situation today? Well, this is roughly the way it looks. Here's the world population uh, since 1950, and here is the uh, population using solid fuels. So you can see um, uh, back in 1950, it was, you know, 60-70% of the world was still using solid fuels. Now our current estimates are about 40%. So it's getting better, right? Went from 70% to 40%. We can go home. No, it's getting worse. The abs this is absolute impacts. The absolute impact is going up. There are more people using these fuels today than there ever been in human history. There are more people using these fuels today than there were people in about 1940 not going away by itself, and this is a problem with poverty metrics in general, why should the poor and these people down here care that they're now two people where they used to be one person on the other side of the line? It's the, the absolute impacts that count. So it's a problem that's lasted one third of a million years and is showing no signs of going away quickly by itself. Now, some people say, well, wood smoke is natural. I like the smell of it. You know, it reminds me of campfires, uh, you know, the Boy Scouts or whatever. Um, somebody knows a little more will say, well, isn't wood just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? This is about all the chemistry you're going to get from me. Uh, and um, uh, listening to John reminds me why I switched to, from chemistry to physics. Um, and, um, uh, and doesn't it burn to just CO2 and water? Well, it does. If it burns completely, it burns to CO2 and water. The problem is it doesn't burn completely. 
and uh, the combustion efficiency, that is the percent of the carbon that's converted to CO2, is far less than 100 percent, you know, depending on the fuel and the stove, uh, as much as 20 percent of it's converted to toxic substances. Now, is this guy exaggerating? A toxic substance is just wood smoke. Well, let me show you what's in that wood smoke. I lied. I guess I'm going to show you some chemistry. Um, here's um, some of the things that are found. Here, uh, this is classic air pollutants, like small particles, aerosols, but it's a vast range of uh, noxious stuff. Um, I, the, I, I, I put them in chemical categories, and then out at the end here in italics are known toxic substances. Maybe some of your favorite things, benzopyrene, benzene, formaldehyde, dioxin, all of these things found in wood smoke. Now, here's a test. What does this mixture of things remind you of? Well, I give my students a hint, you know, that if you're in the health field and somebody asks a question you don't know the answer to, just say tobacco, <laughs> and you're probably right. It's a good guess. This is the same as, what is tobacco? It's incomplete combustion of biomass. Now, the tobacco companies put some extra junk in it, and, and there are differences. But in the broad sense, it's the same set of things. They've identified 7,000 things in tobacco smoke, but they've had tens of billions of dollars of research. Got 4,000 things in wood smoke. I'm sure we'll catch up eventually, or probably not. They're always going to be ahead of us. A lot of stuff. Now, there's no nicotine in wood smoke. I would postulate the world would be a different place if there was nicotine in wood smoke. <laughs> First of all, the good news is there'd be no tobacco companies, right? I mean, I mean bad news there'd be no forests because people would have smoked them. So, but keep to this, keep tobacco in mind. Most people have accepted the fact that sticking burning stuff in your mouth is bad for you. No. Those, many of us can remember decades previous when that wasn't the case, but most people have accepted that now. All right, now think of a thousand cigarettes an hour burning in your kitchen. That's what we're talking about here. Not in your mouth, but in your kitchen. And then, other, and then maybe it's not so surprising that there's such big health effects when you think about it that way. And then secondly, babies don't smoke. Well, I did see one on YouTube that was smoking, but... <laughs> Babies don't smoke, but babies are in kitchens. So this describes, in a nutshell, why we see big health effects. All right, what comes out? And, you know, and I told the, the general category, but how much? Well, uh, you can't measure everything all the time. Even the tobacco people don't do that. So I put down just a few of the big chemicals. Um, and I just show you carbon monoxide particles, benzene, and so on. You don't need to know these numbers, but notice that the amount of the health based standard is far underneath what we find in village houses. They're being exposed to a lot of this. You know, in one sense, I, I just came from a WHO meeting to set guidelines, you know, indoor air quality guidelines related to this. And I said, in one sense, we shouldn't need to go further than this. These three things are group one carcinogens, confirmed human carcinogens by the international agency that does such things. Why should we have to go further? Why should babies in the, anywhere in the world be exposed to excess amounts of three known carcinogens, you know, even aside all the other stuff? But unfortunately, you know, the irony of this business is the evidence you need in these settings are much higher criteria for that evidence than we'd need. You wouldn't allow this in the U.S. The National Guard would come out if this was going on. The best single indicator is small particles, which is John, uh, you know, is the world's expert on aerosols. So I will speak about that mainly. It's certainly not the only thing in there, but it's just the best. It's just what cigarette people do. The tar on the pack of the cigarettes, the amount of tar content, that's cigarettes people way of saying small particles. All right, so now uh, they asked us to talk a little bit of our own, as John did, our own personal history on this. So I'm going to take this sort of uh, timeline here and uh, sort of describe uh, what we've been doing and what I've been doing on in this area. So. The very first measurements of this, as far as we know, were in 1981, when the world was, I don't know, 50% or so uh, use of these fuels. Um, this was in India, uh, which at that time had 85% households using these fuels. Now, how did this happen? Well, I did some work in rural areas on an energy project, and um, right after I moved to Hawaii, after my doctoral degree, and it didn't take very long in village houses to see these kinds of smoky situations. Um, but 
We couldn't find anything. We didn't have, you know, uh, any way to search the internet or anything in those days, but we did the best we could, couldn't find any studies. So, um, and the question is, how smoky is it? Large population with daily exposures, no measurements done, apparently. Um, but we can estimate, little, you know, simple little physics model, none of this chemistry stuff. Um, we can estimate roughly what um, the indoor levels are. We know what fuel usage roughly, we know emission factors of these kinds of fuels, we know the household volume. We didn't know ventilation very well, but you know, we could still estimate. So um, we did a study, it was published in 1983, and, um, but the work was done in 81. Basically, before it, we sort of made a little model, estimated what these levels would be, you know, assumed a village house, uh, volume, uh, wood use, uh, air uh, emission factors, and so on, based on fireplace studies in the EPA. And um, since we weren't sure about ventilation rates, we did a range of these, and these are the estimated levels of the particles in the room based on these different ventilation rates. And um, I know you don't know these units very well, but just consider that the health base standard's around 100. And these were the numbers we were calculating. So we could hardly believe these numbers, yet we could find anything wrong with them. So what to do? Measure it. So we did the first study, which was in um, Gujarat in Western India. And um, this, as far as we know, is the first person in human history to have her exposure measured in the oldest occupation in human history. And um, uh, in Gujarat in 1881, now, you showed, you, John showed you his instruments, airplanes filled with multi-million dollar gadgets and uh, teams of graduate students do, doing many, many flights over. Well, here are, here's our instruments. <laughs> and um, now, things have improved a bit since 1991, but not that much. So the pump is taking a sample of air through the filter here, right, in her breathing zone. It's a pretty good example, maybe illustration, one example of what she's actually breathing. And, um, you know, and then you take the filter and weigh it before and weigh it after, and you can do some chemical analysis and so on. So what did we find? Well, this is what we assumed, uh, and this is what we found. 6,900 micrograms, apparent ex air exchange rate was about 13. Since then, we've done a lot of measurements of air exchange rates. It's right in the middle of the air exchange rates we typically find in these houses. And that's a lot of air exchange by American standards. The I mean, typical houses here are about 0.5 air changes per hour. But you couldn't possibly live in a house that had 0.5 air change an hour and have 1,000 cigarettes an hour burning in your house. Um, we also found other things that we've duplicated many times first. I mean, I had occasion to look at this old paper because of this. And, um, we found that cooking outdoors doesn't help all that much. The problem is not the indoor so much as the bad combustion. It lowers it, but it's still hardly anything healthy. We also found that the so-called improved stoves, what the Indian program used to call smokeless chulas, chula is the word for cook stove, you know, didn't do much. Uh, and you can see um, there's a slight reduction in the, in, apparently, in the, in the um, amount averages for the smokeless chulas, but given the confident, you know, the uncertainty, the standard deviation, they're not statistically significant. This is very typical. We found this dozens, if not hundreds of times since. So-called improved stoves, so-called smokeless stoves generally don't work. And I'll talk more about that at the end.